Welcome back, everyone, to the afternoon session of our symposium on Robert Creeley's library. Welcoming back also our long distance viewers. We've uh, heard already, John Mathias heard from Nathaniel Tarn in a faraway place. Shout out, Nathaniel. Uh, and uh, so um, we're very happy to have everybody here in the room and everybody uh, watching us wherever they happen to be. This afternoon, we have two sessions. Uh, first, uh, Kaplan Harris will speak about the new selected letters of Robert Creeley. And second, we'll have a panel of Notre Dame graduate students talking about their work in the archive itself. Uh, and so, let me just briefly introduce Johannes Gorenson, who's an assistant professor in the Department of English, where he teaches poetry writing in our creative writing program. That's a terrific looking book, man. Um, I, I'm really pleased to be, to be introducing Kaplan Harris, who came, graduated from Notre Dame 10 years ago, got his PhD here, and has since then gone on to become um, a very prolific scholar, writing from uh, about a range of uh, auth modern American authors. Uh, you know, if you look at the list of things he's written about, you can see Hannah Wiener right next to Esther Pound. I think that's my joke. That, that's, that's kind of that's kind of not a joke. It's like a, it's uh, it, I think it's a test to some of the range, and I th and also he has written about uh, for example new narrative, and the interesting take on the new narrative is that it considers it in the social context of the AIDS epidemic, um, and I like that is the approach. Of course, very very important because it, it considers this important devastating um, disease on American culture, but it also is a writing that does not uh, forego formal in interest in the form of the writings. I think that's really important to have this kind of, uh, to have a, a wide-ranging approach to the subject matter, and I think you can see that in the new narrative articles. And he's also written about the lawn, Hannah Wiener's lingerie, which is maybe a little more lighthearted take on this kind of wide-ranging approach. And you can see it in the letters in, uh, in this book that we're celebrating today, it's like the letters of Robert Creeley, where, uh, which tells, an tells, a, uh, tells one of the most important poets of modern American poetry, tells his story through his letters um, uh, in a way that I think uh, you can see, it's interesting because you can see uh, Robert Creeley grappling with the various ideas over a period of time, and it, so Creeley does not become just like a great author in you know, some kind of hygienic space. And, right? this is, uh, I think this makes a really important um, contribution to the study and the reading of, of Creeley. And especially since Creeley is such a figure that has, seems to have so many, there seems to be so many different Creeleys, like everybody has their own Creeley. Uh, so it might be especially important for a figure like that and who seems to be, and there seems to be new versions coming up all the time. Um, and uh, so I'm, I haven't read the full book, but I, I'm really looking forward to reading it. And I also, it also seems to me that um, for a writer who's famous, I mean, famous is supposed to be minimalist, he seems to have lived a very maximalist life. So it seems like a real page turner. So I'm really looking forward to hearing you talk today. So please welcome. Thank you, Johannes. Um, and uh, just start by saying thanks to um, Steve Fredman for organizing this. Steve was my director. Uh, a decade or so ago. Um, I haven't been back to South Bend since then. Much has changed. Um, but I did spend a couple happy years here in, uh, in the library in a, in a study carol just up here, um, right underneath uh, Touchdown Jesus' uh, left armpit, I'm pretty sure, is where I studied for my exams and so forth. Um, I um, also want to thank Laura for helping to acquire the papers. Um, um, it's great to see such coordination, such cooperation between an English department and a special collections, so that doesn't always happen. Um, and I want to thank um, Steve for his talk this morning and Penelope for your talk. Enjoyed both, them, both of those talks. Um, Steve today asked me to not write a formal paper, but to um, work my way through some of the highlights in this project, the Selected Letters of Robert Creeley, uh, which began um, approximately 10 years ago when I moved to DC to start work on my dissertation. Um, at the time, 
Creeley was working with the University of California Press to put out his later collected poems, a new selected poems, um, and then a selected letters. Um, he had tapped Benjamin Friedlander uh, to do the selected letters. And um, then they were discussing who might be a, a, a smart choice for editing these letters. And Creeley, um, my understanding is that um, when Ben Friedlander put forward the name of Rod, Creeley said, hey, that's a great choice. Uh, like Creeley, Rod had left college at a um, midway through. Uh, he'd started a magazine, started a press on his own. And um, so there was a sense in which this would not necessarily be a book that would be shaped by the vision of an, of an academic, per se, uh, but by a poet who was an autodidact like Creeley himself. Um, and so Rod said, yes, I want to do this project, but I don't want to do it alone. Uh, because I don't, you know, I don't know archives that well. And at the time, I was finishing up some work on Susan Howe, thinking a lot about editing and archive issues. And um, I was really, and Rod said, how about we put this kid, Kaplan Harris, on the project? And that's, in a way, how I got on the project. And Peter Baker, as well, I should mention, he's um, uh, the other editor on the book. He's been fantastic. He knows academic presses and the ins and outs and those, of those things. Um, so I thought what I'd do today, in terms of the book, is read a few paragraphs from the introduction then do one sweep through the book using some visual images up here, and then go back to the book and read some of my favorite passages from the letters. Um, so let me just start by reading from the introduction. Um, one thinks of Robert Creeley foremost and primarily as a writer. That being the case, it must be said that a large part of that writing, even the largest part, the volume of it, was correspondence. Simply the list of names of correspondents available at the Stanford Special Collections website runs to well over 100 pages. This website listing all the correspondents used to crash my computer 10 years ago. You know, back when, like, you know, slower computers 10 years ago, they couldn't load these big pages. Uh, there are, in addition, substantial collections of his correspondents at Washington University in St. Louis, the University of Connecticut at Storrs, as well as numerous other archives and private collections around the world. We have sifted through this correspondence with three aims in mind. The first, as he requested of us, was to tell the story, that is, to tell what he did. The second was to track his thinking, his poetics, philosophy, and politics across six decades, the six decades that our selection represents. In other words, what he thought. And the third was to tell the larger story through the prism of his engagements, of the individuals and societies he encountered. The last, of course, is necessarily the most contingent aspect of the project, Yet it seems fair to say that this volume represents not simply a history of Robert Creeley, but also a version of recent history, literary and otherwise, of and within the post-Second World War world. We begin this volume the same year as the moment first, sorry, we begin this selection the same year as the first volume of Creeley's collected poems, 1945, which finds him on his way to Burma to serve as an ambulance driver. There follow lengthy like lengthy letters to fellow writer and editorial collaborator Jacob Lead, who came up earlier in Steve's uh, talk. There follow a few lengthy letters to fellow writer, uh, sorry, these reflect the humble situation of, a, of the young New Hampshire chicken farmer with the voracious intellect that would shortly engage Ezra Pound and William Carlos Williams and inaugurate an intense dialogue with Charles Olson that would quickly and irreversibly, quite literally, change the concept of poetry for our time. With his friend Lead, Creeley had hatched a scheme to start a literary magazine to be called The Lidditz Review after the small town in Pennsylvania where they planned to print it. In contacting Pound and Williams and others, Creeley was soliciting both writing and advice from the previous generation. Creeley was 24 years old when he began writing to William Carlos Williams, then, who, who was then 67, initiating his connection with a poet who was and remained for him a guiding poetic sensibility. The Williams correspondence proves remarkable not only for its invaluable contribution to the poetics of our time, but also as an autobiographical document. Creeley wrote regularly, but by no means weekly or even monthly to Williams, as he often did with other correspondents, particularly Charles Olson. As a result, the letters are often a summation of recent developments, writings, moves, romances, literary politics, and so forth. It was through Williams that Creeley came into contact with Charles Olson. Now, the celebrated Olson Creeley correspondence, edited primarily by George Butterick and published by Black Sparrow in 10 volumes between 1980 and 1996, covers only a period of their letters between April 1950 and July 1952. 
So two and a half years <laughs> in 10 volumes. As Butterick notes in his introduction to the first volume, there are roughly 1,000 surviving pieces of correspondence in all, with Creeley outwriting Olson at a rate of three to one. <laughs> Not sure people really know that fact. That, I hope that sinks in. Uh, the approximately 3,000 pages of Creeley's letters to Olson, housed at the Olson Archive at the University of Connecticut Stores, make up about a fifth of the 15,000 or so typed, handwritten cards and faxes we have collected or reviewed, along with a practically uncounted, uncountable number of emails. Creeley early on recognized the potential literary value of the exchange with Olson, publishing as the Mayan letters, a selection of Olson's letters from the Yucatan, uh, 51 to 52, on his own diverse press in Mallorca <coughs> in 1954, and then reprinting them in his edition of Olson's selected writings from New Directions in 1966. The letters by Creeley to Olson after 1952 appear here in print for the first time and only hint at the dimensions of Butterick's unfinished project to print all the letters by the two poets to each other. Lasting influential connections also made in the early 50s are documented, documented in the correspondence with Sid Corman, Larry Eigner, and Denise Levertov, and many, many others. So I think I'll stop from the introduction there and turn to some images from the letters up here. This is our cover, of course, a picture by Jonathan Williams. Um, here's one of the first letters in the book. This is when he, uh, I don't know if you can see the return address up here. It's January 17th, 1945. It's a letter to his mother, Genevieve, and his sister, Helen. And the return address is somewhere at sea. Uh, and it's a ship with little clearage. Uh, and um, we've got this letter in the book. It's transcribed. But this was, these are letters from when he was in the service. Uh, in the Indian Ocean and then in India. This here uh, is a letter that, uh, a letter home uh, that was marked out by military censors. And so we've got some of that preserved in the letters. It's easier for me to read it here. But it says, my eye uh, presented a problem a few weeks ago, which I'll now tell you about since it, since, it is, since it has solved. While in blank, we don't know where, because this was marked out, was, uh, um, we stated the blank and one night, before going to bed, I wrapped the eye in a handkerchief and, let it, and left it in my bedside table. Well, the, um, well, he goes on, to be brief, uh, wait, I just lost my place. Well, to be brief, came, uh, somebody came in in the uh, something. It's, uh, anyway, it goes on to say that basically, it, while somebody, while straightening out the table, dropped the eye um, out of the handkerchief onto the floor. It was obviously smashed. You can read the bottom line. Um, and then he goes on to talk about how he wore a patch to Calcutta, and then with the help of uh, our uh, something chief was able to go from there to the American Army Hospital, and he got a new eye, and it does not it naturally fit as well, but so forth. He goes on and on about these travails with smashing an eye. Um, the best eyes in the 1940s uh, were made by Germans. And so that was not a good time to order a replacement eyes. Um, here's an early letter to Charles Olson, really only about two months into their correspondence. You can see already he's saying, Dear O. Uh, they quickly adopted the shorthand that became a signature of the great Black Sparrow correspondence. Here's a letter to Olson as he's traveling around. We have many postcards included in our book. I'm just going to go through some of these quickly just to give you the range um, of correspondence. Here's an early letter uh, about visiting in the 1960s. I'm so grateful to see with you. These are some of the Charles Olson letters. Uh, we also track his correspondence with Ezra Pound. Ezra Pound at the time was in St. Saint Elizabeth's Hospital for the Criminally Insane. This is a letter from April 1950. And if you can see the way... Creeley, oops, I guess I've got this on auto advance. Creeley, uh, it says, to Creeley, misspells his name. Strictly anonymous communication is what it says at the top. Um, and it's got, it's got pound, um, I, I sometimes think of this as a kind of hazing of the young 23 or 24 year old would be editor who's asking for contributions. And, um, oops, and, and pound is telling them who's gonna read this, but just the, you know, the, a couple of your friends um, so it was going to be called the Literature Review, which was going to be the original name of the magazine. And um, Pound 
really wanted um, it to be called the Del Mar uh, Quar uh, Monthly. And if you couldn't manage the Del Mar Quarterly, then I mean monthly, then do the Del Mar Month. I mean quarterly. Quarterly. Sorry to get it out. Um, and who was Alexander Del Mar? Was um, a 19th century monetary historian. Was what Pound wanted the magazine <laughs> to be named after. Um, <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, Creeley sometimes had to go through um, Miss Pound as like a proxy. So some of the letters are actually addressed to her, you know, to sort of be I don't know, smuggled in. So this is just a holiday car card. This is a great letter to Olson that we have, uh, July 19th, 1953, quoting this famous poem, the unsure egoist is not good for himself. So the unsure egoist is a, you know, a, a line that's frequently quoted in Creeley studies. And he basically says that it, this is a, um, that, that's, that, Bur that Charlie Bird Parker taught him to say, that, that, you know, to write in these ways. Um, what's interesting about this letter in particular is it's not just talking about um, ideas of the self or the lyric speaker or the rhythm of the poems, but the larger context of this letter is a critique of the great books programs that Robert Hutchins at University of Chicago started, um, and that, um, as, you, as you might know, uh, John Andrew Rice, who founded Black Mountain College in the 1930s, founded Black Mountain, Mountain College um, in direct opposition to the idea of a great books program. I mean, th these two, Hutchins and Andrew Rice, were like nem they were nemesis with one another in the, uh, uh, they, um, in the 1930s and 40s. So you've got the founder of Black Mountain College saying stuff, you know, like we need to, ha we need to break open the Western canon kind of thing. So here, here's Creeley saying, I'm influenced as much by, you know, Charlie Bird Parker as I am by Bach. Um, this is a Christmas card from the Diverse Press in the 1950s. Um, I, this went out to people around the world. I love how transnational this was. Um, you can see, oh, this, uh, somehow I have this presentation on the auto advance, but, uh, but you can see Montreal at the top, you can see Tokyo, you can see um, Majorca, uh, New York, San Francisco's up there, um, Toronto's up there, Contact Magazine, he cites. Um, Creeley, <coughs> Creeley thought of his correspondence in, in a, a very global way. Um, he had no hesitation. Um, early on, he, in 20, when he was only 22 or 23 years old, he was published in VU magazine um, in Tokyo. There's this picture, I mean, this, I found this magazine in an uh, archive, and there's a picture of Creeley, young Creeley, and it's, and it's translated into Japanese, and you can see the, the line breaks, and it's his poems. And how did he get in touch with this um, um, uh, uh, Kitaoi Kitasano was his name. And um, the, how did Creeley end up in Tokyo when he's 22 or 23 years old? He um, had gotten a hold of the Pound newsletter published at the University of Berkeley. And in the back of this Pound newsletter, a very cheaply produced thing in the early 1950s, was a distribution list that was kind of a, like a Rolodex of the world avant-garde at the time. All these people that are translating Pound into French, into German. Uh, Zukovsky is in there with his name misspelled. When Creeley first writes to Zukovsky, he misspells the name just because he's lifted it from this, 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 this newsletter. Um, and this is how he gets in touch with the very famous Reynard Gerhardt. If you know Olson, Olson um, Ger Gerhardt took his, was friends with Creeley when Creeley was in Europe. And, uh, but then Gerhardt took his life in the 50s, and um, Olson and Creeley um, both, it was such a, a central moment for them. Um, this is a great one, 1957. Dear Charles, I'm trying to get straight with the grad, graduate school here, if I can make it like they say. They want two copies of a transcript of my theoretic record. Here's what you've given me early in case you have no copy there. And so it's like basically, can you imagine writing to the registrar and saying, hey, I, here's my grades. Could you just give me an official version of this with a 4.0 grade average? <laughs> um, and uh, and so, so, of course, you know, Olson sent him a, uh, sent him a you know, he, Olson responded that, even though we're bankrupt, I still invested with the power of the rector, and I can just write you a transcript. <laughs> so that helped him to get one of his teaching jobs. Um, at, at, when, when Black Mountain goes bankrupt, uh, Creeley becomes like a roving reporter of sorts, traveling around the, the U.S. and the world, and he's writing letters back to Olson. Uh, so here's one from San Francisco where he says, as it happens, I'm out here with Jack now. This is Jack Kerouac. He's just walked into town to get a fifth of port. 
And he, and, he, and, and he has by this time read Mayan letters, and I'm giving him Maximus, and other things of yours, when we go back to San Francisco Saturday. You'll best get a sense of him as follows, 34 years old, French-Canadian, about 5'8", a little stocky from Lowell, Massachusetts. He writes novels, a lot of them actually. <laughs> Anyhow, he is God knows a pleasure. Talks very little, listens a lot, could have been a wino, but isn't. Likes to be by himself. One of those slightly uh, red-faced quiet men. And, and then he goes on to describe the prose of On the Road, before On the Road, is right before On the Road is published. And, he tr and in this letter, he transcribes several pages of the manuscript. Um, just to show what his writing is like. This is a letter to Warren Talman in Vancouver. Um, as, you, as, you, as you know, Greeley moved to Vancouver for a year, and this is a um, telegram accepting the, uh, uh, the job. Uh, uh, here is, there's, there's many afterlifes to Creeley's letters. This is a letter to uh, Jane and Stan Brackage. And Jane Brackage would put these letters in scrapbooks and draw all over them and put other kinds of pictures in them. So these are online at Yale now. We had these scanned, and we'd hoped to put them in the book, but um, the cost of production would have, um, we had a, a limited number of images we were allowed to use, but you can see these at the Yale Beinecke digital website. Um, so there's a few more. I like this one here uh, on the right. You, can, you see there's a poem in the middle, and, and it's been, the whole thing's been filled up with her drawings. I assume those are Jane, Jane Brackage's drawings. This is a letter to, we have lots of family letters in the book. This is a letter to Bobby Louise Hawkins, uh, drawing what his apartment looks like when he's um, in Buffalo teaching in the 70s. For a long period, um, Creeley was back and forth between um, New Mexico and Buffalo. And um, you know, one semester there, one semester in Buffalo. And so he's drawing his apartment writing to her things like, hey, could you send me a recipe once a week or maybe once a month just so I'm not, you know, cooking the usual eggs and hamburger all the time? Uh, you know, uh, maybe a, looks like a Valentine's letter to Bobby Louise Hawkins back in Bolinas from 73. This is, a, this is a letter that he sent that was written on a menu when he got on a plane flying back from Belgium. Um, lots of letters writing about his dis discomfort in uh, academic settings. So here's one uh, about what he's going to wear in Buffalo. Here's postcards. Here's a letter to Jonathan Williams complaining about the North Campus at University of Buffalo. Which is, we have letters documenting the founding of the Poetics Program. So. Here's a letter to Susan Howe. It looks like we're headed back to Buffalo. They offered such a deal, it would have been perverse to say no, certainly after 23 years of accommodation and much use, actually. Both president and provost were calling both Penn and me. We didn't know they cared. And the upshot of it is, I'll be a university professor, independent of department or faculty. We'll negotiate labors with provost directly, which he states will be in a range of zero to minimal. <laughs> They're paying such money as I'm ashamed to tell you, and to that, they add a new chair for backup. It's really incredible. Anyhow, I do hope you'll be there, question mark. And of course, who ends up at Buffalo uh, a year or two later? Well, she, she'd already been teaching there one time, I think, at this point. But the founding of the Poetics Program is, is within a year of this moment. Uh, lots of warm letters to Allen Ginsberg. Dear Allen, it's very good that you're feeling back together after the gallbladder surgery. God knows, never a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> so onward by God. <laughs> This is one of his first emails. We really wanted to document different kinds of correspondence. Um, so here, I don't know if you remember your first emails in 1993. Here it is. Uh, Dear Peter, cancel previous advice insofar as I have error in identifying my own user ID, such as age. Well, let's start again using our previous in, up to which all was well, and even Creeley was on the mark, but shortly thereafter, we fucked up. As follows, Creeley at VBUMS should read Creeley at ubvms.ccbuffalo.edu, which I think you knew anyhow. Looking at this page of report re-inability of your dearly anticipated letters, failure to arrive. <laughs> help viz, quote, will help arrive in time. Tune in next week, et cetera, et cetera. Your humble idiot savage, Bob. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, we, you know, we tried to retain some elements of the, of the correspondence, like dates and, and of the different kinds of technology that are used, letterheads in some cases. Um, a lot, just enormous numbers of short emails appear. Um, just the kind of back and forth, almost uh, uh, texting, um, which I tried to track down, by the way, any kind of text as part of this, but I, uh, or AOL uh, conversations, which I could not get a hold of, but I wanted to have those. But uh, here's just emails to Charles. I hope to make the reading, but I can't make the, beal, the, the meal. This was a card, an annual card. This was sent to Amiri Baraka, Robert Creeley's 70th birthday. And um, uh, we don't include this in the letter, but I just love this one with the asterisk at the bottom. For the 70th birthday party, asterisk, I get in free. $6, I get in free. Anyway, so um, I, for, let me just spend 10 minutes reading or so reading from some of my favorite, uh, I think I can leave that up, some of my favorite letters here in the book. This one's kind of long. Um, this is a letter to Jonathan Williams, 1953. Jonathan at the time had been traveling around in Europe and he had met Rainer Gerhardt. Dear Jonathan, I had a note from Rainer, along with your last letter, and if this is any evidence, I think he thinks his wife is in love with you. <laughs> At least that's the substance of his note. Big troubles with Jonathan for Renata. I think our marriage is finished. <laughs> the rest of the note, mainly a statement to the effect that he does not want you to publish his book, which is understandable, assuming this idea on his part. And, in fact, he is very mixed up and a mess, generally. <laughs> Jonathan Williams. Um, here's a letter to Kenneth Rexroth. Uh, when the first issue of Black Mountain Review came out, um, there was a, um, a rather negative review anonymously um, assigned, uh, uh, anonymously signed in the, um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the back. And of course, Creeley had written it. Um, and so anyway, upshot is they got into several letters of debate uh, between the two of them um, about Rutka and uh, Patchen. Um, so here's, there was a spate of letters from their argument. This is 1954 to Kenneth Rexroth. I can't offer you any equivalence of experience except to say, as what I am, that I do care that writing this process such as I have known it gives me that relief. They're talking about violence and sickness and poetry and, and um, basically Rexroth was apologizing for Rutka saying that, um, you know, he was not mentally well. That is, it, it is, at best, what I am. It gives me that relief. At 17, I used to hand out pamphlets for, for the, at the Four River Shipyards. We were trying to break the company union and get the CIO in. My mother was a nurse, and my father died when I was two years old. I have one sister who is miserable. My mother, now almost 70, will be up for retirement this year, whereupon she will go to live with her sister. At 18, I was in Burma. Every morning, I got up to get out of the ambulance and stepped over stretchers that had about a I had about an inch of blood in them. I saw people die, as many as my age did, in every conceivable posture. I have no longer, nor can I ever have, the least tolerance for any sickness per se. I suffered too much from sick minds and the purposes to which they commit themselves. And he goes on to some length and ties ideas of sickness to, and violence to the writings of Hart Crane. Um, Jerry Robert, this is a letter from Black Mountain College. This is a letter to Robert Duncan, 1955. Dear Robert, I'm sorry not to have written. The past week or so has been exciting to say the least. E.g., last week I was, in a, I was a passenger in a car which found itself being driven into a house at 40 miles an hour. <clears throat> the Asheville paper reported it under a picture of the car as driver hits own residence. <laughs> Anyhow, the past month has seen a pathetic variety of attempts to make it one sleeping pills, one wrist, and the car was the third. All of which here seems simple enough to make a bit ridiculous, nor can I, I guess, not find it that in some sense, i.e. my own dilemma, never seems to take on that cast. I have at that a horror of being ridiculous, not by my own choice, so resolve on no such things as the above. Anyhow, I got a twisted shoulder from the accident and a bang on the nose, and I also got a never-to-be-gotten view of a, of a house <laughs> rushing out to meet us. 
<laughs> Somewhat like a triumph of the home at that. <laughs> the car was completely demolished, and the house was not e even dented. Dan Rice and I were sitting in the back seat. Tom Field was driving, such a mild young man usually, but of course with this, <laughs> with this thing very much under it, and George Flick, who was in a position to be most hurt, yet survived with very little to show for it, as I did. Dan fractured a vertebra, but will be all right, praise God. <laughs> Tom dislocated his hip, and will be all right. It was all unbelievable. So, lots of good driving stories. There's a number of unpublished poems that appear in the letters. One of my favorites is this one. How about that? It must be horrible when you are dead to know you planned just a little too far ahead. <laughs> many, many descriptions of places he lived, of his teaching. Here's a letter to William Carlos Williams. I got a, this is from Albuquerque, New Mexico. I got a job here teaching in September, which has had the use of giving me a means to eat for the moment and also to pull myself together for some more concerned attack. Perhaps it's the very formalism of how I acknowledge such things that separates them so much at times from me. I don't know. For a while, I was certain I had fallen into a means of living, i.e. teaching, which was both reasonable and sufficient, even to hope of a family. But restlessness or not, that soon enough became untrue. I've been teaching French and English, caring nothing per se actually for the first, except for the delight that teaching a language I don't know at all sometimes gives qua improvisation, like they say. <laughs> and caring too much for the second, that is English. Tomorrow I start to work again. There's six classes a day. I was teaching six classes a day in 1957. English seven, French eight, English one, French one A, French one B, and English eight. I think that's six preps. All of which jargon means 12 to 14 year old boys, about 10 to 15 in a class, a finely lethally oriented group of eventual people. <laughs> eventual people. <laughs> Get on. Um, let me skip on for the sake of time, because I do want to allow time for questions here. Let me just read a few more here. Dear um, Warren, 1963, May 7th. Uh, this is, a, a, as you, it's sometimes in 1963, as Frank Davey has, um, has, has noted, it, what's called the Vancouver Poetry Con Conference or Festival, um, that it only gained that name much, much later. Um, and uh, Warren Tallman and Creeley uh, were the two forces behind putting the conference on in 63. So here's a postcard to Warren Tallman. Dear Warren, can you please find out as soon as possible how quickly a voucher for a ticket, one way only, if round trip can't be managed in advance, can be gotten for Allen Ginsberg with place of departure open for New Delhi or Calcutta? He's getting plenty worried about it, which is my fault, but I've written him along with that, with that this, that, they'll, that he'll hear from you directly. Otherwise, all's well. We'll write a decent letter shortly. So, of course, getting that ticket was central for Ginsburg coming to the conference. Many, many letters to Denise Levertov going into lots of detail about poetic writing, poetic, you know, his, his sense of poetry. This is 1963. Um, she's been commenting on poems, and he says, if I must say, I'd like to depend on your sense of those poems I sent, which much reassures me. I've come to a kind of locked sense of things which compels me to tear up almost everything I write of the last year, except for the novel, finally, where my ignorance of the formal possibility gave me actually a relief when I saw that things were following, so to speak. But with poems, and somehow that summary quality of the damned book, in that sense at least, and all the damned talking about poems my job has pushed me to, I'm falling presently over my feet, viz confusions constantly. That was the bankruptcy sense that got so insistent at Vancouver this summer, I think. I hate what I know in my own work. One of my favorite lines to, to Allen Ginsberg, he says, all my poems are social crucifixions, Allen, you know that. <laughs> Great line. This is 1966. A letter to Mr. Bella Zimpley, Program Officer for Division for Americans Abroad, Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, Department of State, Washington, D.C. Dear Mr. Zimpleny, I'm very sudden to have I'm very sorry to have this sudden shift in plans. 
the more so have, after having given initial acceptance. But I now find that I'll be unable to go to Pakistan this summer. Briefly, I am very disturbed by the growing dilemma in Vietnam, so that to go to a country as Pakistan at a time when an implicit political crisis is so evident, and to go as the guest of the State Department in apparent support of a president whom I deeply question would seem a deep and inadmissible confession of my own purposes and commitments. I am blessed to share a community with other men in the act of writing, and it is their respect and belief that I am also much aware of. I cannot outrage the community of my own identity. I also have a deep loyalty to the fact of this country and the persons in it, and in that sense also I cannot commit myself finally to any program which is involved with executive acts and attitudes so hostile to the nature of this country which, within the possibility of my own acts, I have tried to honor and make known to others. So there's a lot of political letters like this that we try to include. Letters, uh, there's a great letter to, to, uh, uh, to the Albuquerque Journal about getting pulled over so many times because he has a beard. And, you know, he says, look, I'm, I'm a... I'm a full professor at the State University of New York. I'm listed in Who's Who in America. Where did I go wrong? You know. Um, letter to Tom Clark about the Poetry Wars in 1985. Regarding Barry Watton and his book, I just like the shift that he manages on Olson, for example, or Clark Coolidge, just that he keeps explicit and takes it in terms of literal language construct. I liked him on Smithson, too, Robert Smithson. In my so-called line of work, the endless vagary and disjunct of thinking frankly makes him very clear, not to mention that he's talking of action the academic won't touch with a ten-foot pole, like Olson or even Williams, for instance, nor Zukofsky. So it's a long defense of Barrett Watton's there. Let me just, I'll close with one of my favorite sequences here, and then we'll do some questions. Letter to Kurt Vonnegut, 1996. Dear Kurt Vonnegut, this is sent from Buffalo. A few years ago, when your opera was being put on in Buffalo, Allen Ginsberg brought you over to our place for a curious breakfast of somewhat burnt toast and black coffee. <laughs> with my dear daughter Hannah, then about eight, in, eight years old, in attendance. It was a good-natured meeting, which neither of us forgot. So, when a school friend said that her favorite writer was you, Hannah said she had met you here in Buffalo, which the friend wouldn't believe. Would you therefore do me this very particular favor, i.e. write a couple of sentences to say that Hannah had mentioned her respect for your work and that you have whatever reaction, like they say? They're 12 years old, a hopeless time for girls in classic, classic day school lacking alternatives, and it simply matters to be believed when what one says is true. Otherwise, I wish the Academy would somehow get one day a real life. I mean, there's a little bit more. Um, it, and then he adds Hannah's name in the P.S., which I, I won't say here. But then a follow-up letter about two weeks later. Dear Kurt Vonnegut, that was such a sweet and generous re reply in support of Dear Hannah, and it did the job, like they say, with absolute effect. As it happens, it came on the friend's birthday, so it was all usefully converted into a genial, extra-suitable for framing uh, letter. So anyhow, everyone was delighted and grateful. Thanks for coming through with such promptness and consummate wit. You are not a terrific writer for nothing. Anything, anytime I can do anything for you, of use in return, you got it. Love from Hannah and me, Robert Greeley. So there's tons of emails that we have as well, but I think that just for the sake of time, um, maybe open the floor to questions at this point. So, thank you. volumes of letters to choose from. Can you talk a little bit about your process of you yeah, narrative? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I'd be happy to. Um, well, so um, when the project began, we, we had a, a letter that's actually included in our book from Robert Creeley to Rod Smith, um, suggesting, as I mentioned in the introduction, that we tell the story, that we track the thinking, we track his network of associations. So with that in mind, um, started gathering letters um, uh, from archives around the world, archives from people's attics, from people's hard drives, when they would send them to us. And we started accumulating things, and we started ranking the letters. Um, and there were three of us, and the photocopies that we had were, I, I mean, 
that we just have file cabinets and file cabinets and file cabinets of these things. And um, we, we, we ranked them on a one to five scale based on some of the criteria that I just laid out for you. And we started transcribing the fives, the top, the very top letters. Um, and we, um, this was maybe about five years into the project or so, about midway into the project. And we're gathering all this material and we're putting it all together. We're starting to look, you know, sometimes letters tell the same thing. You might have a couple letters from Guatemala that recount the same set of events. Um, you might want to choose the best letter that recounts news of some ex major experience in his life. Um, but we started putting together the letters. And um, I should say at this point that we had a word count limit of 190,000 words. Um, and we're putting things together. And, and, and we realized that we've already got over 250,000 words of just those five. I mean, the best of the best of the best. Pain. And so, so what happened, and we, that was without introduction, without notes, without all that apparatus. Just each letter was had something, had a had an essay project hidden in it, or you know, if you track down the full story behind the letters, there's a dissertation there or chapter or something like that. Um, and so we overshot by quite a bit. We had to make a lot of cuts, um, and um, we, but ultimately using those three criteria, we, we we did get the manuscript down to a place where we could have a, a nice introduction and some notes at the end. Um, uh, you know, he definitely wanted letters, as, as I said, to family included, major figures. Many of the, there's a lot, of, there's many, many letters in the 50s, that's when he um, was traveling around the most, well, 50s and 60s, but um, he, that, his letters get shorter, they tend to get shorter as time goes on, um, but you've got more letters. So a random month in, say, uh, you know, 2000, year, like maybe 1999, he might have 600 emails in just one month, they're, but they're shorter emails, so there's more of these things included. Um, but so it was just a, a matter of trying to tell a story of his life. There's lots of holes. It's, you know, there, there could be more uh, collected let I mean, selected letters to come out later, um, I think. There could be, um, you know, maybe some books of correspondence back and forth with particularly intensive, intense correspondence. But, um, and we, and we, di we didn't cut any letters. We tried to have every letter complete. So, so does that help? Yeah, it was the, co the contract we signed early on. It was a certain number of images and a certain number of words and so Which forth. Which depends on the cost of producing them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Were, um, uh, you mentioned that some of the idea of some projects that might be comprised simply of back and forth between Creeley and someone. Who, who, who are some of the people that... Um, I think that some of the... <laughs> The, the, the best dialogues to see back and forth would be um, uh, Blackburn and Creeley, Levertov and Creeley. Um, these are the people, it, it, you quickly get a sense of who he's writing deep letters to versus kind of superficial you know, letters that might just have to do with copy editing things or, hey, can you send me this? You know, just kind of, kind of more sort of admin, like administrative type letters. The, the deep ones where he's wrestling with things and you see his, his, um, his, his thinking process would be people like Dorn, Levertov, absolutely. Um, uh, it's interesting. Well, and, uh, Dorn, there's, there's quite a few great letters to Leroy Jones and then Amiri Baraka. Um, one of my favorite letters, I didn't read you, it's quite long, is where uh, Leroy Jones at the time has sent the manuscript for blues people to, to, to Creeley. And he responds with a letter that's practically a book review mm -hmm. um, and um, goes into lots and lots of detail <laughs> before, before the book is published. Um, so I said Blackburn, they had a falling out at one point, but then they got back in touch later. Um, uh, well, it's, there's, 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 there's great later correspondence uh, with Stan, Stan Brackage, which would be another good one to have. So. Not Duncan? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, of course, Duncan, yeah, yeah. yeah. Lots of, Duncan's letters are fascinating with, and with, with, with Creeley because Duncan has, in some, you know, he is always an, He's a little bit older than Bob, yeah, I'm sorry, Creeley, but um, he's often giving Creeley advice, not just on poetry and poetics and po politics, that, that letter to the State Department was prompted by Duncan, but also on family things. And um, Duncan's letters, um, you know, are like Jungian psychology applied to Creeley's love, you know, relationships and so <laughs> forth. Um, you know, the man, the woman, exclamation, I mean, I'm capitalized, you know, kind of things. They're, they're very... <laughs> 
So, <laughs> um, yeah, they're, they're great, the documents. <coughs> so. Yes? I had another question, kind of about process, but uh, uh, so when uh, Creeley was writing letters, he wouldn't keep a copy, did he? Of uh, handwritten letters? Uh, not generally, yes. But emailing, mm -hmm. he would keep a copy of every email, I mm -hmm. suppose. Um, that would be, that, uh, yes, yes, that, that's true. Because sometimes we talk about, you know, the change of people not writing anymore. Mm -hmm. But in fact, the email makes it easier to find somebody's correspondence mm -hmm. if they had the sense to keep a copy of what they themselves were writing. Yes. Because for the others, you had to track them all down to different people. Yes. The, yeah, to our, find letters. The, yeah, yeah. The, all the outgoing letters are in archives around the world. Um, yeah, with the email, um, Creeley uh, was sending his hard drives to Stanford, um, and during you know during the ten years of working on this project, um, many of the you know many of these debates I think were happening among archives of, of what, how do we preserve these things, how do we make them accessible, and so forth. Um, and I will tell you a funny story that um, when I first went out to uh, one of my first trips to Stanford, um, I went out there and I was there for about two weeks. Stanford's where um, a, a Levertov's letters are, Ginsburg's letters, some Eigner's out there. Um, and I was requesting from the archive that I get a copy of these digital email files. And it was pretty early on. They, they had had a kind of newly appointed digital archivist at the time. And he gave me a DVD. And he said, well, we've just burned everything on the DVD for you. Um, and um, so I put it on my old laptop. And it told me it was going to take, you know, of course, an hour to transfer everything. Uh, so I go to lunch, I come back, and I open up things, and, and it's, it's amazing. There's, there's all these email files from, and, uh, some, and also Word document letters going back to 1989. Um, so I'm reading through them. I'm so happy that we, will, we can just cut and paste some letters instead of transcribing more and more of these things. Um, and then my computer starts getting funny. And, um, and with comic timing, the archivist ran back in and told me he had forgotten to scan for viruses. And I had about 15 years of viruses on my computer. Uh, historic viruses. <laughs> and uh, and, um, and a, friend, a, a friend of mine who was a computer scientist at Pixar helped like, clean, you know, clean up my, my, my thing. But, um, but uh, anyway, the upshot is, these, yeah, the, you know, Despite the dangers of archival research, um, uh, the, uh, these you do you do sometimes get both sides of the correspondence, but there's so, it's it's going to be I I I'll, I'll be I'll be curious to watch this unfold with other editions of email correspondence because you know you know, you know the, these are old, do you remember mosaic web browsers and Netscape kind of email files and all this kind of stuff is it, all the all these old software things are in there, and Creeley would oftentimes put attachments on emails. Um, you know, so he would say, here, Tom Rayworth, here's a picture of me in my new big shorts, you know, or uh, here's, uh, you know, here, I'm sending you this, you know, pirated jazz album kind of thing that I've just burned for you. And, of course, the email text is like this, but you open it up as a text file and it goes for just miles and miles and miles of computer code, which is going to take some, some pretty savvy stuff to decode. Stories you're telling, which is incredible, and the move to email and stuff. It seems like this is a movement. This is a movement's the wrong word, but a, a set of figures whose interactions, you know, are the art. You know, the, the interactions in the living community that they formed and the age together and the ideas that grew, and, and and therefore the correspondence is so germane to what we think of even their body of writing. Or for me, it really is. And it's so exciting to hear these excerpts and see the images and to feel that. When I think about my very contemporary moment and the writers who are younger than me that I know from Facebook, and then I like know their work from the work that's linked to their Facebook posts and stuff like that, and in a way it's like a hypertrophy or an atrophy of this kind of literary relationship, you know, and I, I wonder what you think about, um, obviously there won't be many more generations of writers that you can make the deep study that you're making of, mm -hmm. uh, but, but I wonder if you think that contemporary networked writers, writers who are now in their 20s and early 30s, maybe, um, do you find this to be um, deeper, a more shallow, a more refined, or just the next version of this kind of um, 
literary uh, network making as a kind of like collaborative literary almost work of its own. I'm sorry if this is too vague, but well, I mean, I think about it. I think about the critique of like Facebook culture of contemporary writing. Yeah. That it's shallow or something like that. Mm -hmm. But in some ways, its structures, you know, are not unlike what's being described today you know, in your talks. So yeah. I'm wondering what, how you put these ideas together. I yeah, I I, 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 hazard to say um, that any kind of quality goes up or down. Yeah. Um, you know, there's just new forms of people exchanging information. Mm -hmm. But I do find, when I, when I would go through his letters and look at his network of associations, I would find myself thinking, so, this is his social network. Yeah. He's getting all these addresses from the magazines he's reading. This is the technology for putting people in touch around the world at yeah. this time. Um, the, and a letter to Jacob Lead, a college friend, uh, might begin with, um, you know, kind of daily events like you might see in social wor network world, where he'll describe, sh you know, his mixed feelings about shooting sh uh, woodchucks that are eating the the potatoes in the garden, right? And he goes on and on about it's a great, it's a hilarious letter. He's talking about treeing, you know, like different animals, and he feels terrible about shooting them. But then he looks at all the food that they need, and so he, and then. He goes into Hannah Arendt on violence, you know, in the middle of this thing, when it, and because he's been reading her articles on the Holocaust, you know, and 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 he's thinking about evil and is it, and then it spirals into like, is it okay to kill dictators? I mean, you know, this is one letter that goes yeah. through all these different stages, and you know, Melville and Ahab is in this. This is when he's in college, you know, he's in his twenties at this time. So yeah, yeah, I guess I would say that when I'm corresponding with other poets that I know either only from. Uh, Facebook, or I've met and now basically know on Facebook. Um, yeah. I never yeah. know whether what I'm doing is actually happening or not, or just yeah. some like job I'm performing for Zuckerman, or like what what oh, the yeah. Yeah. Mark Zuckerberg, or, or what the story is. And but when I hear this talk you're giving right now, I feel so much like euphony with the kinds of network exchanges um, that you're describing. That it's it's yeah. yet another uncertain, disconcerting. <laughs> Um, piece of information for me to think about, like what yeah. Like, uh, well, the zoo, literary the, the, relationships. Or the, yeah. Well, that's that's, that's like, yeah. That's that's. Can that's I say sure. Yeah. I, I'm not entirely sure that I'm understanding what you're saying, but it makes me think that I want to make clear to you that Robert had no sense of making any kind of literary record. The letters were not, mm -hmm. as far as he knew, at the time he was writing them, for the record. Right. I see. And he completely was not a career builder. He did I, not think yeah. of himself as having a career mm -hmm. or any sort of stamp on history or any sort of literary. Clearly he wanted to make things different, but he was not structuring a life in any way he was living. That's an important distinction. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. And um, yeah, so there wasn't any sense that he was gathering a record or creating a record or saying things for the sake of making a statement in the letters. Mm -hmm. Of course. That's yeah. helpful. Yeah, there's, there's, I'll just read this one line. I, I, um, if you look at, uh, one thing we wanted to do with the book was to emphasize um, how much of a nomad he was. And the book is organized uh, by sections that are, the first one is Burma, New Hampshire, uh, the second one and France, the second one is Majorca, Black Mountain, San Francisco, then Guatemala, Vancouver, Helsinki, Bolinas. Um, we wanted to emphasize him moving around. And he's often doing so just to find cheap places to live, to have these correspondence, to have this correspondence. And I love this one line. You just mentioned Zuckerberg or, or whatever. So um, he sent out a prospectus for diverse press when he got started. And he said, printing is cheap in Majorca. And for a small press like our own, it means freedom from commercial pressures or career pressures. It means, too, that we can design our books in a way that we want, since they are handset and made with an almost forgotten sense of craft. Above all, it is our chance to print what we actually like and believe in. So there was a sense of moving to places that were cheap just because for the sake of art. On, on that uh, point about uh, writing uh, for friends and, uh, and not for, for posterity and not one eye one place and the other eye the other, the contrast to that in this archive um, in the Ed Dorn part of it would be the letters from Jeremy Print, which I happened to read uh, a few weeks ago. And they are so extraordinarily written for history that I can't think of anything to compare with them. Uh, they're mostly written on old IBM Selectrics, 
and there is not an error of any kind, even in letters of many pages. I mean, not a misplaced comma, not even one of these old-fashioned uh, eraser tape um, gizmos yeah. that you can you know, detect if you left, if you read carefully. <coughs> and I began to read obsessively, actually looking for some kind of error, and there are none. <laughs> Which means those letters were typed on IBM Selectric's you know, again and again and again until they were completely error-free. And although the lingo, sometimes uh, rather achingly artificial to get onto uh, Dorn's uh, wavelength, uh, is um, a kind of casual idiom from time to time, the intention yeah. is altogether opposite. Yeah. And that, that would that would be the, the total reverse of uh, of these uh, letters that, yeah. that you've edited. Well, well um, yeah, it's funny. This summer I read the um, the Prin Peter Riley letters that are at Cambridge, and they're very neatly written. Very, very. I I I feel like each of these. It's calligraphy, just it's obsessive. Just it's yeah, it's yeah, very true. neatly. Um, I about these. Um, I I do think there are moments where. There's an eye toward the, the fact that somebody might later read these, but um, but uh, yeah, I never know how deep or how how controlling that eye that, that one eye on posterity might be in the letters. Um, Creeley was a two fingered typist, as far as I know, um, and he proofread his letters. Maybe Penelope can confirm that, but I heard he was a two fingered typist, and and then and then um, and then we're pretty sure he always would proofread his letters one time, and um, and, and in terms of, he would not really make many, he was a very skilled typist. He, he, he had a great sense of spelling, um, except for Zukovsky that one first time, but then he, that, then he got it right. Um, but, th but then he would sometimes put marginalia, which we tried to preserve. Uh, the marginalia is oftentimes where the jokes appear. Um, and the little doodles, the drawings, that kind of thing, we try, we try to retain some sense of that. Is it time? Sure. Okay. Thank you, everybody.